he sat in the same place every day. It was a prime location there on the steps leading up to the temple. Because as people would make their way to worship God, they would uh, oftentimes come to ask God a favor. And so uh, what better way to prepare God than to drop a coin into the cup of one of the beggars that was there on the steps. And so here he is each day. He's on those steps with his cup, makes enough money to pay rent on his hovel to get some food. Blind since birth, his needs are simple. A place to sleep, some eats. So every day, it's the same routine. With his stick as his only help, he makes his way from his home through the streets and up those steps to sit in that same place. Everyone knows him. Not just the locals in Jerusalem that frequent those steps, but even the people that live around Israel that come for the annual feasts. He's been there for years. They all know him. He's the man that was born blind. And so he is the subject of much debate. He sits there day after day. Countless times he's heard the arguments and the debates of the people who speak in hushed terms. But because he's blind, his hearing is sharper and he, he's able to hear their debate. Who sinned that he was born blind? Was it his parents? And so out of judgment, God's judgment on, on the parents, their son was born with his disability or, or, or was, it, was it him? Did he sin before he was born? Which made no sense to him, but he repented anyway, asking God to forgive him and heal him so that he could see. And then one day, the debate starts all over again. But he's learned not to say anything. There's no point in arguing with these fools. <laughs> Best to just keep his mouth shut and hope that they drop a coin in the cup. And so the debate begins again, and he hears this little group of young men that are arguing, who, who sinned, his parents or him, before he was born? But then another voice is added to the discussion that brings a completely new discussion. This voice says it was neither his parents nor he that sinned, but he was blind so that God could demonstrate his glory. And then there's a moment of silence. And the next thing he knows, he feels mud being pressed into his eyes. Mud? Adding insult to injury. And then the instructions, which seem unnecessary, go and wash. And so he takes his stick and he taps his way to the pool of Siloam and he washes the mud away. And when he does, all of his prayers are answered for the man who has never seen anything now sees everything. Look at verse one again. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Chapter 8 ends with Jesus leaving the temple in Jerusalem. It's been a time of great controversy with his critics, with his opponents, with his men, who, those men that will become his enemies. He leaves through the public entrance and exit to the Temple Mount, the southern steps, which were a wide stairway upon which a large crowd of beggars would gather for that very reason. You know, as people are going up to the temple to worship, most of them going to ask God a favor. What better way to prepare God than by showing some generosity and dropping a coin in some of these beggars' cups? And so it was a great place to beg. That's why this man is there. He was born blind. He's a regular fixture on the southern steps. As I said, everybody knows him, not just the locals, but, but those Jews that had come for the annual feasts three times a year, they were required to go to Jerusalem and to worship God, and everybody knew this man. This day, as Jesus and the disciples make their way down the steps, Though it doesn't say, you get the sense that Jesus stops and he's looking at this man. And the disciples decide, okay, let, let, let's, let's raise this theological issue. 
Let, let's, there's a controversy. There's a debate that has swirled around this man. Why is he, why is he blind? He was, he was born blind. So who's at fault here? His parents? Or is there something that, that he did before he was even born that resulted in his blindness? Their theology had already drawn lines around the possible reasons for his blindness. The Jews of this time believed that your situation was evidence either of God's blessing or his curse. And that depended on the condition of your heart as revealed by your behavior. If you prospered, you were godly, and so God was blessing you. If you suffered, it's because you were wicked and God was punishing you. In their minds, it was black and white. There was no gray. Those were the only options. Jesus got into trouble with his enemies precisely because he was healing people they assumed God was punishing. And by healing them, Jesus was short-circuiting God's judgment. They especially hated it <laughs> when Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. What was really happening is that Jesus was showing his power over sin and death. He was revealing God's compassion, not his judgment. Jesus was revealing himself as the promised savior who was bringing a new age in which the curse was being loosened. His disciples didn't see that yet. They were trapped in the mistaken theology of their time. And so they put the question to Jesus, Who's responsible for this man's blindness, his parents or himself? Now, that seems silly to us because we ask, how can an unborn child sin? But it's an option that their goofy theology required. And having formed it, they then went in search of a scripture to support it. <laughs> And they found it in the story of Rebekah's pregnancy. Do you guys remember this story? When Jacob and Esau were in Rebekah's womb, they wrestled with each other. And they said, oh, look, even before they were born, they were fighting. And that's wrong. That's sin. So you can sin before you're born. And so they went. They have, they have this idea. And then you have to go find a verse to support it. Folks, listen, this is how most bad theology happens. People start with an idea of the way they think they, they, the way they think, think things ought to be or the way they want them to be. And then they go in search of a verse to support their belief. They want to smoke the ganja. And so they go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 11 that says, God gave all the grass of the field. <laughs> they want to support being lazy. And so they quote the psalm that says, wait on the Lord. I'm just waiting on the Lord, brother. This is how a lot of bad theology happens. You know, you get an idea and then uh, I got a verse. The other theory said that birth defects were God's judgment on the parents. But that's hardly fair to the child. Now, we know that, of course, parents' choices can affect their child's health. But disabilities aren't God's judgment. If I jump out a five-story window and shatter both my legs, it, it's not because God is judging me. It's because I'm an idiot. And that leans into a much-needed perspective on what we're looking at today. Why are children born with disabilities or a medical condition that requires special care? In a word, friends, because of the curse we live in a fallen world that's subject to decay and sin and death. Things don't work as God originally planned because humanity is in rebellion against God. Sin has poisoned creation. And that poison sometimes comes out in unforeseen and tragic ways. There isn't always a one-to-one -one correlation for why bad things happen. Sometimes the innocent are victimized. The guilty go free under the sun in this life. That's what Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. He looked at this world and he was, he was torn by the injustices that he, that he saw. 
He, he didn't get it. Why is it he said that sometimes the innocent seem to suffer while it's the guilty that go free? And he lamented this and he, he tried, he applied this incredible wisdom that God had given us to this problem and couldn't come up with a solution. And it frustrated him. And he comes to the end of it and you know what he says? He says, under the sun, that is life lived in this world, oftentimes doesn't make sense. But life under the sun isn't the end. In the light of eternity, God will make all things right. He will bring his justice. So the disciples were locked in an either-or situation with this blind man because of their bad theology. They assumed that our condition is the result either of God's blessing for being godly or his punishment for being wicked. Well, verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. This man's blindness wasn't God's judgment on either his parents or his sin. It was instead an occasion for God to demonstrate his compassion and his power. Now, Jesus is not saying that God blinded this guy. Yes, God made him, but not his blindness. His blindness was the result of the curse. Some genetic defect or, or, or maybe some glitch in his development in the womb. But now being blind, he becomes a showcase for God's glory. Jesus is going to heal him. And by doing so, prove yet again that he is more than a rabbi. Because no rabbi nor prophet of old ever healed someone who had been born blind. Now, friends, there's an important lesson to learn from Jesus' response to the disciples' question. When confronted by this blind man, the disciples saw an object of theological curiosity. Jesus saw a man that needed to be healed. They pondered the cause. He proposed its solution. When they asked, why is there suffering in the world? Jesus replied, let's do something about it. Instead of wondering how a God of power and love can allow evil in the world, let's reveal God's power and love by doing something about that evil. Let's stop sitting around and arguing and debating theology when the needy are perishing and going to hell. Folks, let's stop the discussions, the debates, the arguments, and let's instead reach out and start doing something. That's what Jesus is saying. Guys, listen, here's a guy that has need. Why are you worrying about the cause of it? Let's fix it. Let's do something about it. Too much talk. We need more action. Evil exists because people choose it. Let me hear an amen. amen. Evil exists because people choose it. This is the great risk that God took in creating us free. He created us to enjoy an eternal, intimate love relationship with him. But for love to be real, it has to be free. And free to love means free not to. In essence, that's what all evil is. It's taking the love that God gives us, and instead of giving it back to him to who it rightly belongs, we spend it on something else. Most usually, who do we spend it on? Ourselves. Evil exists because people choose it. And sadly, its victims are often the innocent. It's others that suffer. If God ended all evil, the human race as we know it would cease to exist. We can't even imagine a world like that, where people are free, but God stops evil consequences. I, I, this is one of the questions that every religion and every philosophy is, is challenged by. If God is real, the God of the Bible, the Bible's saying that he is all-powerful, all-loving, and all-wise. Then why is there evil in the world? Well, think of this. If God were to stop all evil, we can't even imagine a world like that. Let me propose a scenario that will get this across. A man in his car 
is coming to an intersection. The light turns red. He decides to ignore it, and he plows through the intersection. Coming the other way is a young mother with three children in her car. They're going to collide. But in this world that we want, God takes that man's car, and he sails it right over hers so that they don't hit. Tell me, in a world like that, where we make a choice to do something that is going to bear a consequence, but God doesn't allow that consequence to happen because we demand that he not allow it to happen? What happens to a world like that? What happens to the traffic laws? Is anybody going to stop at red lights anymore? Is anybody going to obey the speed limits? Is anybody going to obey any of the rules or the laws at all? No. So consequently, our choices don't have real consequences. And if they're not consequences, have we really made a choice? You see, we can't even imagine a world like that. This is not, please hear me, this is not the best of all possible worlds. Would you agree with me that if there was one less molestation or case of abuse, it would be a better world? Would it be a better world? If there was one less rape, would it be a better world? If there was one less traffic fatality, would it be a better world? Yes. See, listen, this isn't the best of all possible worlds. But we believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ makes this the best way to the best of all possible worlds. Because God gives us choice and allows those consequences to bear out. But in history, the day will come when Jesus Christ will bring an end to all evil. Without violating our choice. He will redeem our power to choose. We'll stay free. And one day there will be an end to all sin. And what we need to understand is in the story that we're looking at right here, Jesus is demonstrating for his disciples who he is, that he is the savior, that he is the redeemer. He's bringing an end to the consequences of evil by healing this man's blindness. Verse four, Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, Jesus knew that the days of his mission were winding down and that he would soon be returning to the father. But while he was here, he would stay busy doing the father's will. Verse six, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with a saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam meaning sent. And when he went and washed, he came back seeing. In all of the healings that Jesus performed, <laughs> we never read of him doing it the same way twice. Every time it's different. Sometimes he speaks, person's healed. Sometimes he will lay his hands on someone, person's healed. Most times we just read he healed. There's no description of the technique that he uses whatsoever. So, so why here? Why, why make mud with his saliva? He, he's doing something unique, different. The commentators go wild with this, explaining why Jesus made mud. And in the end, it's all guesswork, isn't it? Because there is no explanation given. I think there's an excellent reason that Jesus is doing something unique. It's, it, it's really not why we should be looking at how he did it or why he did this particular thing. But, but what's going on here? Why this? I think simply because he wanted to do something different. So that we would not think that healing was the result of some formula or technique that we use. I, you can almost picture Jesus kind of going back. Okay, I've healed people this way, this way, this way. What, what else can I? Oh, oh, I'll just spit and make some mud. I haven't done that yet. Some years ago in the charismatic movement, there was a, a, a movement within the charismatic movement that was really into to healing. And the leaders were going around the country and they were holding clinics to teach people how to heal. They, they taught people how to pray, even how to lay hands on people. 
I remember going to one of the meetings once where I was watching people pray for somebody that had come forward for, for healing. There was a physical need that they had, and they were doing this. They weren't touching the person. Their hands were a few inches away, and they were, they were doing this. And I'm like, what is going on? Oh, they were looking for hot spots on the person. What is going on? I was, and they were taught to do this. Can you learn how to heal, folks? Can you learn how to heal? No, healing is a manifestation of God's grace. It's not something that you can learn how to do. Either God miraculously bestows it or he doesn't. It's not a formula. It's, if it was a formula, if there were right words that we could use or you place our hands in just a certain way, separate your fingers a half an inch from each other, and that would be magic. That's what magic is. Manipulating a technique to accomplish some desired end. No, healing is a manifestation of God's grace. And yes, God often heals in answer to prayer, but how we pray isn't the issue. The issue is what the illness's purpose is. Let me, let me say that again because this is important. It gets right to the heart of what we're looking at today. What's the purpose of the illness? Does it exist to accomplish something only bearing it can impart? Or is it simply something that God wants to deliver a person from to demonstrate his power and his grace? You see, friends, this blind man and Job have similar stories when you think about it. Both bore afflictions for a long time without understanding why. But both were subjects in a great drama with cosmic implications. What Job and this man endured was tough. But in the light of eternity, as both of them now stand in glory, do you think that either of them regrets what they endured? Is Job in heaven right now wagging his finger at God? How could you allow that to happen to me? Or is he rejoicing in the example that he has become to tens of millions of people throughout history? Job stands as one of the greatest men of faith, but there was no way to that apart from what he endured, folks. Do you think this blind man who is nameless to us now who one day we will meet, one day we will know, and we will know his name? Do you think he's in heaven, upset with God for allowing the years of his darkness? Or is he rejoicing that there was a day that he was on those steps and Jesus walked by and proved that he is the redeemer of history and humanity? You know this man doesn't regret his years of darkness. Without the years of darkness, he couldn't become the subject of our study today and a lesson to us on the power and the grace of our God. This man is rejoicing in the opportunity that he had. Because please hear me, our lives here are very short. But the glory of God manifest in you through the work of the Holy Spirit, the power and the reality of the gospel is a lesson that is going to last for all of eternity. Your testimony <laughs> is not the years of darkness and the years of loss and trial. That is not your testimony. The testimony is how God saved you from all of that. Christian, Jesus heals. Healing is a part of the gospel. But please hear this. The timing of our healing is as much a work of God's grace as the relief that that healing brings. Both the what and the when of God's work is perfect. This man was given sight on a day that was right, not just for him, but for the disciples. You see, this chapter begins with it saying, and Jesus passed by, but you need to go back to chapter 8. He was leaving. He had just passed by his critics that had taken up stones to kill him. I want you to put yourself as we end. Think of this. Here, is, here are the disciples. They're seeing their rabbi. 
They're seeing the, 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 the leadership of Judaism there in Jerusalem, in the temple, rising up in opposition to their rabbi, picking up stones to kill him. And their mind, suddenly their relationship with their, their rabbi becomes very tenuous, very uncertain. What's going to happen? Jesus has just said some, some amazing things. And it's, it's, it, it's threatening to kill him. And if it kills him, what about us? And 30 seconds later, Jesus is standing in front of this man and he heals him and gives sight to one born blind. And all of a sudden, all of their fear, all of their worry, all of their concern is now consumed in the reality. Oh my goodness, he's more than a rabbi. He is the promised redeemer. Some of you have been enduring a trial and illness for a very long time, you've cried out to God, why and when? You need to hear this. Because God wants to step into your story and heal you. He will do it at the right time. It isn't just the what of your healing, but the when of your healing. He will heal you when he gets the maximum glory and you get the maximum lesson. And lastly, as a pastor, as I share that truth, which I believe with all of my heart, I think of those here who are saying, but Lance, what about my husband or my wife that wasn't healed, that died of that illness and now they're gone. They're in heaven. And right back to you, I say, they were healed. The fact of the matter is, all of us, all of us, apart from the turn of Jesus Christ, all of us are going to come to one last illness that will only be healed by walking through the doorway into heaven. Hey, but listen, when we get there, are we going to say, oh darn? Are we going to say, Oh, yes. Because that, too, is as much God's sovereign, perfect timing as the deliverances and the healings that we receive in this life. The point is, trust God. Trust him. Hold on to him. Why is this happening to me? When is God going to heal me? at just the right 